The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. This evening, the DuPont Cavalcade tells the story of a man, typical of so many foreign-born pioneers, whose loyalty to his adopted homeland helped its growth to greatness. John Jacob Astor, in the early days of the Young Republic, saw the vision of American commerce taking an equal place with that of the other nations of the world. Together with commerce, one of the factors that made America what it is today is the work of the many research chemists who are continually advancing the standard of living by supplying us with more comforts and conveniences. Their contribution to our daily life is well expressed in the DuPont Pledge, Better things for better living through chemistry. Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play as an overture, Pale Moon. DuPont Cavalcade moves forward. John Jacob Astor was born July 17, 1763, in Waldorf, a village in the shadows of the Black Forest in Germany. In early youth, he resolved to come to America. And as our story opens, we find a large sailing vessel nudging its course through the misty capes of Chesapeake Bay. 
It is a windy morning in January, 1784, as Captain Jacob Stout, master of the schooner, and a passenger, Nathaniel Prime, drive swiftly across its deck to the rail, where two young men stand watching the approaching shores of Maryland. One of them is playing a flute. Are you John Jacob Astor? I am. Astor, the passengers have complained to me about your flute playing. I'm afraid I'd better ask you to hand it over to me until we dock. My flute? Well, all right, Captain. Here it is. Only... Won't you accept my word not to play it anymore? I think, Captain, the young man's word will suffice. I'm sure he can be trusted. Now, suppose you return his flute to him. Well, Mr. Prime, the passengers have asked you to represent them in this matter. Whatever you say is all right with me. There you are, Aster. Thank you, Captain. Now I'll be getting up on the bridge. Seems to be a lot of ice forming on the bay out there. I don't like the look of that. I'll join you later, Captain. I'd like to have a talk with this young man. Very well, sir. Thank you, sir. May I present my friend, Mr. Sherman? How do you do, sir? I've heard of you. You're on Sherman of the Hudson's Bay Fur Company, aren't you? I'm the London agent. Uh, How is it that an American like yourself ever heard of the uh, Hudson's Bay? (laughs) It's a Canadian enterprise, you know. Oh, I have to know all about these colonial concerns. I'm a banker. I live in New York. I think I'll be happier in New York than I was in Germany. You just left Germany, Arthur. I can't understand how you mastered English so quickly. Well, I've been in England for years. When I was a little boy in Germany, we used to hear all about America. But after working in my brother George's flute shop in London, I decided one day to buy seven of his flutes and come over here. (laughs) With only seven flutes? Oh, I got $25, too. And... Maybe I can sell the flute. Well, in America, one thing leads to another. You won't always be selling flutes, Arthur. Uh, do you know anybody in New York? Only my brother Heinrich. He's a butcher. I think he stalls in fly market. I've been telling Jakob all about the fur business during the crossing, Mr. Fry. Oh, and what do you think of it, Arthur? Well, it's too small now to be of any consequence to American commerce, sir. Mm-hmm. You know, while I was in London, I used to study every night about British commerce. That's what made England a great nation. Yes, it is. If America is ever going to become great, too, she'll have to develop a much more expensive commerce, I think. Mm-hmm. I've been talking with Sherman about on the voyage, and I'm sure fur could be an important element in achieving this. cost young Astor his remaining $25 to take a stagecoach from Baltimore to New York, where he landed with only the seven flutes to his name. His brother Heinrich got him a job in Diederich's Bakery, and Jacob peddled trays of cakes all over the bowery. One dusty evening, we find Jacob together with Heinrich and his wife, Dolly, enjoying themselves on the bowling green in old New York. The evening is particularly jolly for Jacob because he has brought along his girl. Her name is Sarah Todd. (laughs) 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 By golly, Jacob! Let's have a try at the (laughs) nineteenth! Henry! No! You said we're going to play clubbing the cat, Ned. No, no, Dolly! You mustn't tell your husband what to do! He will chop the cat by and by. Oh, Sally, I warn you. Don't marry an actor. Look at me. I am, and you seem healthy enough. You must like it. <laughs> healthy? <laughs> That's rich. Well, almost as rich as all those pastry cakes Sally eats so she gets so fat. Herr Schmidt, are the pins set up? Oh, yeah. Who's going to be first? Better let Jacob bowl before you, Heinrich. You're not so thin yourself, and you'll need all your wind. So save it up. <laughs> all right, all right. Take a ball, Jacob, and roll it down the green. All right. Watch me get them all in one throw now, huh? <laughs> oh! Perfect, Jacob. Ah, now it's your turn, Heinrich. 
Mike, if you don't knock them all down, you could win. Yeah, no. I win. No. <laughs> oh, my golly, I have to do better than I ever did before. <laughs> all set? Yeah. Here it goes. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Good work, Arne. Good work. You got every pin, too. Yeah. Hey, shall we try again or quit for the even, huh? Well, I suggest you both stop now while everybody's happy. Anyway, we'd better go over and play clubbing the cat before it's too late. Uh, Heinrich, uh, you and Dolly go ahead, huh? Sally and I join you after a while. No, yeah. Oh, uh, we don't want to play that nonsensical game anyway. <laughs> yeah, but... We'd rather have some stewed pears. Uh, wouldn't we, Sally, huh? <laughs> Much rather. <laughs> oh, I see. Huh? I see. They want to be alone. Oh, 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 no. Oh, come on, oh, Dolly. Oh, oh, she's oh, kidding oh, us oh, now. Look. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's uh, let's find a bench where we can see the water, Sally, huh? All right. My, it's very beautiful in the park at twilight, isn't it, Jacob? Yeah. It's really beautiful tonight. Everything's beautiful tonight. Look at all the lights of the boats in the bay. I envy those little boats out there. To us, they seem to be lost in the shadows, and yet... Really, they're so sure of themselves. They know just where they're going. Sally. Oh, here's a bench. <laughs> yeah, a bench. Shall we sit down? Yes. Sally, right now, we're at the very bottom of New York. I want to go up. Up the length of this island and out beyond, into the great country that lies far away to the west of us. The pilgrimage is a long one, and it'll be a hard one. But I must make it. I want to go into the fur business someday, you see, and... Sally. Yes, Jacob. I can't imagine such a picture without... Well, I've known you quite a while, haven't I? And as I was saying, I can't imagine it all without... Without... Me, Jacob. Yeah. Well, Sally, you don't have to say yes right away. Look, in a second, the chimes at Trinity Church will strike the three-quarter hour. Tell me your answer when they stop. I can't wait much longer than... But after all, Jacob, why not? Jacob. Of course I want to be a part of your picture. Yes, Jacob. You must have known I did all the time. Oh, Sally. <laughs> and when John Jacob Astor married Sarah Todd, she brought him a dowry of $300 whereby he was able to go into the fur business. For many years, Jacob tramped the American wilderness, collecting his pelts. One night, we find him stopping at Fort William, a trading post at the Grand Portage on Lake Superior, where the early North American fur traders periodically congregated, calling themselves the Lords of the Lakes and Forests. A feast is in progress. Trappers, voyageurs, and several Indian chiefs fill the great hall. Jacob is talking with an old fur trader, Seigneur Louis Montfort. <laughs> Why, all oh, this is unbelievable, Senor Monfa. Why, why, it's simply magnificent. I tell you something, sir. We have to live like Viking chieftains here. If we did not impress the Indians with pomp, they would impress us with a tomahawk. <laughs> you, uh, you're mostly a Canadian here. Aren't there any American fur traders besides myself? Americans? Huh? What do Americans know about fur? There is no American fur trade. Only Canadian. The Hudson Bay Company, the Northwest Company, my friend. Senor Montfort, I'll see that we have our own fur trade in America one of these days. Our commerce demands it. <laughs> but as long as there is no American fur company, who can your traders deal with? So that the commerce can be developed in the United States. They will trade with me when I set up a big American fur enterprise. I'm anxious to start the trading tonight. Oh, oui, oui, the trading. Well, the feast is almost over. 
Pretty soon we tried, and then we have the Indian dance. We deal with those two Indian chiefs at the end of the yard, who represent the tribes around here. The Sacks, the Foxes, the Winnebagos, the Yohans. Ah, here, they come to start trading. I will introduce you. White brothers, many moons have passed since we met at Grand Portage. Welcome, almighty chief. This is Jacob Basso of New York, White Fisher. Oh. And this chief, my friend, is Red Ox. Uh. My daughter Marie, she married one of Red Ox's sons. I will allow you to trade with the chiefs first, Basso. I am honored to meet White Fisher and Red Hawk. I'll be brief, Senor Montfort. Here is a fine copper kettle. What am I offered for it, almighty chiefs? Ten beaver pelts. <laughs> and what for this hatchet? One muskrat pelt. Mr. Astor, may I speak with you a moment in the next room? Yes. What is it, Jonathan? It's very important. Uh, I come right with you. Uh, you go on with the trading, Senor Mufat. We are Kundi. In here, sir. Now, Chief, what am I offered for this act which I have here? Okay. Is it all right to talk here? What about that half-breed sitting over in the corner? I want you to hear what he has to say. Come here, Francois. All right. Now, Francois. Tell Mr. Astor what you just told me. Hey, what is all this, anyway? Murder. Red Hawk. He is going to kill Senor Montfort during the uh, Indian dance tonight. What? But that's terrible. We've got to stop him. Are the other chiefs in on this, too? Oh, but no. White Fisher and the rest like the senior. But Montfort's daughter, uh, Marie, she ran away and married one of Red Hawk's sons. Yes? She practically make a white man out of him. This make Red Oak angry. Oh, I see. The Red Oak squaw uh, told me all about it. Uh, I'm a, uh, a half breed, and I come and go as I please at the Indian Council. But how's Red Hawk going to kill him, Senor Montfort? Well, he sings an old uh, Indian love song during the dance. His squaw say when he come to the line, hear the falling tree, the song of water, oh my sweetheart, my Algonquin, he take out his knife and stab old Montfort. Nobody will be expecting it. I see. All right, Jonathan. Yeah? Be glad him when he does. I like Senor Montfort. For a Canadian for trapper, he's been mighty nice to me. Francois says White Fisher and the rest will hold Red Hawk captive if we can expose him when he draws his knife. Good. These engines want peace at all costs. Huh? The dance. It is starting. You'll have to hurry. Come on, Jonathan. Yes, sir. Come on. <laughs> ah, you're back. Hey, sit down. Sit down. Enjoy the Indian dance. Now for a treat. Red Dog is going to sing the old song. Listen. Yeah, I'm ready for him. And we'll lama ya to la ku we la ya na ho. Hey, Jonathan! Jonathan! I kill him! I kill him! Hold him, Jonathan! Wait, Fisher. Fox Braves, take Red Hawk prisoner. Put him in guardhouse. Red Hawk, never forget. Winnie Vegas, never forget. Never forget. Red Hawk, never forget. I will always remember you saved my life, Arthur. It was nothing, Senor Mutfa. It all goes to show that we traders, no matter what we are, throughout North America, should really strive to help each other. We have a real job to do. When Astor returned to New York, he founded the American Fur Company. His resourceful mind and intrepid spirit led him to establish a network of trading posts winding across the western ranges of our territories. Jacob became the greatest merchant of his day. His ship, spanning the seven seas, laden with American fur cargoes, helped establish our young nation in the field of international trade. It is now 1808, and we are in the dining room of the Astor residence, at 223 Broadway. Jacob is giving a small dinner party for Wilson Hunt, a well-known explorer, 
and Captain Jonathan Thorne of the United States Navy. Now then, gentlemen, light up your cigars. Mm, thank you, Jacob. And you. <laughs> I've got a great idea. I'd like to discuss it with you. I gathered you had something on your mind, Jacob. Is it the American Fur Company? Has it got anything to do with your merchant marine, Jacob? No. You're both wrong, Thorne. I've been down to Washington. President Jefferson commended me for establishing an American fur company and increasing our foreign trade. He said, we needed to develop international commerce, Mr. Astor. I only wish our frontiers might be colonized as well. Old Daniel Boone said the very same thing to me last time I saw him. So, I told the president, I thought the reason for that was because our country was too uh, one-sided. Our whole national life is in the East. Why should people leave the Atlantic seaboard when there's nothing out west but a wilderness? The president replied to this by asking me how we could develop a national life in the West. And what did you tell him, Jacob? I said, by establishing a seaport on the Pacific. Oh, oh really? Now, if this could be done, I just think. The United States would have access to the two largest oceans in the world. But uh, who would establish this seaport on the Pacific, Jacob? That's the reason I asked you to have dinner with me tonight. You and Hunt Boat. Oh. You see, gentlemen, I need you. I am going to back a colonial expedition to the Oregon Territory. And you must set up a seaport there. That's my idea. It's going to be mighty dangerous, Jacob. You know, the Russians and the British also have their eyes on Oregon. Yeah. And the southern Pacific coast belongs to Spain already. If America's ever going to have a western sea coast, she's got to colonize Oregon now. And we'll do it, gentlemen. And we'll do it by land and water routes. I'm with you, Jacob. So am I. And, gentlemen, so is Thomas Jefferson. Now, I've got some maps here. You hunt? Yes, we we'll leave by Overland Trail. Mm -hmm. You'll proceed to St. Louis. Then up the Missouri to the foothills of the Big Horn Range. Mm -hmm. And across the Cascade, along the Powder and Snake River to Oregon. Good. Now, as for you, Captain Thorne, how large is your ship, the Tonquin? 290 tons. About 21 crew. Very well. Now, your expedition will go to Oregon by water. Around Cape Horn. Through the Sandwich Islands. Karakua Bay in Hawaii. And up to Cape Disappointment, where the Columbia River empties into the Pacific. Yes, I understand, Jacob. And when you both get to Oregon with your expeditions, I want you to build a seaport on Point George. Then raise our flag over the settlement and colonize the territory for the United States. Astor's plan to colonize the Oregon Territory for the United States went ahead. Wilson Hunt left Montreal with the Overland Expedition, July 5th, 1810. And two months later, Captain Thorne's ship, the Tonquin, sailed from New York. On February 15th, 1812, the stars and stripes were unfurled from the battlements of Astoria in Oregon. As he grew older, Jacob gradually lost his adventurous spirit and lived at home with Sarah in an atmosphere of extreme simplicity. It is now spring in the year 1823. Jacob is 60, and we find him at Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson. It is almost twilight, and the two old men are talking on the veranda. You know, Mr. Astor, you helped develop this country in a very vital fashion. Some of us have given the best years of our life in the service of the nation. Your way has been through commerce, a real necessity in our young country. Do you recall the day you told me about your plan to colonize Oregon for the United States? I'll never forget it, sir. I consider Astoria a great public acquisition. And I look forward with gratification to the time when its descendants shall have spread themselves through the whole length of the coast. You appreciated my reasons for purchasing the Louisiana Territory. 
I'm glad to hear you say that, Mr. Jefferson. And I'm glad you came down here to see me, sir. You, as much as any of us, have labored to make our country great. As a fur trader, a merchant, and in the interest of international commerce and colonization. If I was still president, I could speak for the entire United States. But that's not necessary. We all know, and future generations in this country will know, Mr. Astor, that you are one of our real pioneers, a pioneer in American commerce. On March 29, 1848, in the 85th year of his life, John Jacob Astor died. To Washington Irving, one of the executors of his estate, was entrusted approximately half a million dollars for the endowment and establishment of the great Astor Library in New York City. Truly, such a life forms a saga glowing with American adventure, commercial development, international trade, and colonial exploration. This evening, DuPont is proud to add the name of John Jacob Astor to the distinguished roster of the Cavalcade of America. See if you can tell what this sound is. Probably you've already guessed that it's a man shoveling coal into the furnace. To most people, coal is coal. But to a chemist, a lump of coal is a rainbow of color or the scent of lovely flowers or medicines to guard our health. Take an ordinary log of wood. To most people, it is something to burn or to use in making planks. But the chemist sees in the log a beautiful shimmering rayon fabric or a wrapping of cellophane, cellulose film, or the motion picture film that brings you your favorite movie star, or the transparent plastic that makes safety glass possible. So in many of nature's ordinary materials which we take for granted, the chemist sees entirely new and different things. To him, things are not what they seem to us. In fact, just recently, Popular Mechanics magazine published two articles under the title, Things Are Not What They Seem. These articles take the reader behind the scenes on a fascinating trip through research laboratories such as those maintained by the DuPont Company and tell the stories back of many chemical equipments that serve us all today. How the research chemist transforms spruce wood into transparent cellulose film. How chemistry saved the life of many an elephant by creating plastics as beautiful in their own right as the finest ivory. How gorgeous colors come from black, sticky coal tar and how a soft sponge is made from wood these and many other equally fascinating stories are told. Because these articles relate so graphically many of the things we've talked about on these programs, we thought you of the Cavalcade audience would enjoy reading them. So we've had both articles reprinted in a single 18-page booklet, including 32 full-color photographic illustrations which appeared in the original articles. If you would like a copy, we will be glad to mail you one at no cost. Just write... DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware. Your name and address on a postcard will do. And if you care to tell us at the same time which type of subject in this Cavalcade of America series interests you the most, we'd appreciate hearing from you. When you read Things Are Not What They Seem, you'll find dramatic evidence of how research chemistry is providing, as DuPont expresses it, better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> Clara Louise Kellogg, little-known incidents in the life of America's first prima donna, will be the subject of our broadcast when next week, at the same time, DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.